MB Clip Measures project. Um, I'll just quick introduce myself. This is again the third one and the second um, presentation that I've been on. My name is Jennifer Wright, and um, I am a nursing home administrator and a CPHQ is certified professional in healthcare quality, which basically means um, I've taken some tests and and done some studying and take lots of um, continuing education credits. Um, I am a project coordinator here at Health Insight Oregon, and um, I work with uh, mostly communities on doing some care coordination work, so um, which is sort of like care transitions, although um, we do more of a, um, a community support system where rather than just transitions, we're looking at coordinating care um, all around the person, and so it becomes a lot of social determinants of health work, but um, certainly we focus on the transition itself as being important in getting them started on the right foot when they leave the hospital. So, um, this is, like I said, a series of webinars. This is the third, and um, the series goes through July, and then we'll also be attending the um, Rural Health Conference in October and doing a session there. So hopefully all of you that we've been talking with or two can we can meet you and see some faces. Um, you may notice that this this is being recorded and the idea behind that is they're being posted on our website and will be available ongoing for um, folks that are new to this work to be able to sort of get some basic information around general measures and quality improvement um, principles and things like that. So. Um, in this uh, Zoom meeting, there is the uh, availability of camera if you feel the need to be on camera. Unfortunately, my computer is not cooperating, and so no smiling face for you. Um, so I'll try and smile so that it sounds like I have a smiling face. Um, but uh, I believe that you can see a few of our folks, uh, Katie Urout and Ellen DePratt, um, are on camera. And um, Excuse me, if you would like to use camera, you're welcome to. There's also a chat feature, so please be sure to use that. Uh, Katie is monitoring the chat for us, and so if you have a question or a comment, um, feel free to type it in there. And um, typically we answer the questions towards the end of the presentation, uh, but if you have something like, please stop talking so fast, or please talk louder, um, go ahead and chat that in, or let me know, and I will do my best to accommodate you. Um, again, like I said, we'll do Q&As towards the end, and uh, if you have, uh, if you're having any connectivity issues, let us know, or if you're not hearing, um, again, we'll try and troubleshoot some of that. So, okay, go forward. There we go. Um, today, we are going to talk about care transitions, um, the care transitions measures. And so um, last month, Ellen DePratt gave you kind of an overview of the MBQIP measures in general. And today, we're going to dive a little deeper into the care transition measures. Um, we have three of them that we'll look at. And so hopefully, by the end of this session, you will be able to describe what a care transition is. Um, I know we all know this, but I have some quote unquote official definitions for you. Um, explain the care transition measures. And we'll look at developing some methods for impacting those measures if they're um, some of your lower scoring measures. So, I think it's taking a minute for it to react to me. Maybe. There it is. Yeah, we're just, it's, it's, it's a two, Monday on a Tuesday, I think. Uh, my computer didn't want to connect, and now we're having a little bit of slowness, but. Uh, and it's the second day of spring and we have thunderstorm warnings. So I guess, what is it, March comes in like a lion and out like, is that March, April, mm -hmm. one of them, in like a lion, out like a lion, definitely doing that. So what is a care transition? According to CMS Meaningful Use, um, it's the movement of a patient from one setting of care to another. And so that includes lots of different settings of care, including an ambulatory practice, uh, um, long-term care, home health, um, so pretty much any time they go from one setting to another. And of course, in the case of critical access hospitals, that may also be from 
your hospital to a different hospital, maybe a more urban <laughs> setting or a, um, a different setting that has some specialty care they need. The Joint Commission has defined a transition of care, again, as the movement of a patient from one healthcare provider or setting to another. So again, I think that just makes sure, you know, it encompasses any sort of provider. And I think that's important when we think about, um, sometimes a person doesn't maybe necessarily physically transfer, but the transfer of information from a primary care to the hospital or from um, you as a critical, critical access provider back to their primary care, um, even though the, the patient themselves may not be going with that information in that very moment, it's important that we get that transition happening behind the, the curtains so that when they do go see their primary care again, they have um, all of their information has followed them along. I think I'll just point at you and let you do it. How's that? Okay. It doesn't like me today. Okay. It likes Katie. Mm -hmm. So these are the three measures we're going to look at. Um, the emergency department transfer communication measure, um, discharge information, which is an HCAPS composite measure, it's composite six, and then care transitions, which is also an HCAPS composite, which is composite seven. Um, these measures fall under the heading of reducing admissions and improving care transitions in the MBQIP quality guide. So if you're wondering why we picked these three, that's why. Um, and the first one we're going to talk about, and the one we'll probably spend, spend the most time on today, is the emergency department transfer communication. Um, lucky for us, this is a critical access hospital only measure. Um, we get, uh, you know, because special. Some of us are special and we get to do extra work. Um, not really. This is just uh, because. As a critical access hospital, we're more likely to transition somebody from our emergency department to another hospital um, simply because of the fact that we are small, rural, critical access type providers. Um, this one was designed to kind of capture that. And so there's a special method for reporting. It doesn't go through QualityNet. It doesn't go through a vendor. Um, and so it's just a, a little bit of a different measure. And it's a... Um, a composite measure, so if you can go to the next slide, we'll actually look at what the measure says. Um, so it's used as a to assess the percentage of our patients that are transferred to another healthcare facility. Um, and again, just going back to that definition, healthcare facility is very broad, uh, so we want to keep that in mind, but they're transferring, of course, out of our emergency department to go somewhere else. Um, and then it's about their medical record documentation. Um, went with them in within 60 minutes and there's quite a number of relevant elements that need to be communicated um, and there's one that needs to be communicated prior to the discharge or transfer and so that's our first the first um, piece of the the puzzle so the edtc measure itself is composed of seven sub measures and they're all compiled into one composite or bundled measure called edtc all um, and they're calculated from 27 data elements. So I, I tell you that not to scare you, um, for those of you that haven't actually unpacked this measure totally yet or maybe new to this work. Um, that sounds like a lot, and it is. However, these are, these are very discrete data elements, such as the vital signs. There's six vital signs that each one is a discrete um, element. And so just keeping in mind that there's a lot of moving parts to this, and because it is a bundled measure and it's an all or nothing measure, um, you wanna make sure that you know that there's lots of little pieces that may be causing you to not be as um, successful at this measure as you'd like. And so um, we'll run through quickly some of those, but um, just keep in mind there's a lot to it and it's an all or nothing with lots of little moving parts. So in the denominator of this measure are all transfers from an emergency department to another healthcare facility. Um, and when I was putting these slides together, both Ellen and Stacy said to me, hey, remind them that they only have to submit a max sample of 45 cases because that might be scary if you say all of them. And uh, I was like, oh yes, that's a very good point. Um, it tells you in the, in the quality manual how to select this random sample if you're, again, new to this work. Um, you do need a max sample of 45 cases, and we'll talk a little more about how that reporting works and how many of them you need, but um, uh, 
all transfers is your denominator, meaning that it's your 45 cases are selected from all of your transfers. Um, and if you have fewer than 45, then it actually is all transfers. And so the numerator, any of those patients that transfer to another healthcare facility and that their medical record documented that they had each of the following seven measures communicated. Um, and again, the administrative communication needs to be completed prior to patient transfer. And so um, on the next slide here, we'll look at the seven submeasures. So um, in the typical fashion of CMS, uh, they have bundled up, um, or maybe even, I know this is through the Flex Grant Program, they, they decided that we'll have a measure, and within that measure, we'll have seven submeasures, and within each of those seven submeasures, we'll have data elements, because why keep it simple? Um, and so just to give you an example, the administration, administrative communication is two, um, has two data elements, and those two are the um, healthcare, to healthcare facility and physician to physician communication being documented. And so those are the two that need to happen prior to the dis discharge or transfer. Um, the rest of these will go with the transfer within 60 minutes of it happening, excuse me. So um, again, like I said, there's little data elements in each one of these sub-measures. And so administrative communication, again, has two patient information, includes six sub-measure or um, data elements. Vital science is six. Medication information is three. Uh, physician or practice generated information is two. Nurse generated information is six because we all know that nurses do most of the work. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, and then procedures and tests have two data elements. So that's where you get the 20 measures um, out of seven submeasures, or 20 data elements, excuse me, out of seven submeasures. I need to slow down and stop mixing up my words. Um, and so to meet uh, one of these submeasures, the transfer record needs to meet every data element within that submeasure. And so again, because it's bundled, you need to meet all the data elements in order to get, to pass, if you will, or to um, comply with the, the bundled EDTC all measure. Um, so that's a, I'm gonna take a little um, jog here and talk about why uh, we focus on the EDT measure or emergency department transfers and again we talked about um, as a CA, as a critical access hospital it's, it's more likely that you'll transfer a patient to a larger urban or I don't know why it says urban in this because that's the definition but just a facility that has something that they need that you can't provide um, I'm thinking of some of our really rural areas you may actually transfer to somebody um, within your same county say Coos Bay, for instance, that might transfer to Bay Area Hospital, which isn't necessarily urban, just might have a few more specialists on site. Um, and we focus on this because it helps us to reduce the hospital readmissions and adverse events in hospitals, because of course, um, communication is the root of all evil. That's my paraphrase, but um, it does seem to be true everywhere I go, and all of the work that I do with care coordination and quality improvement. Um, our communication, uh, how well we communicate something really does determine how well the patient is going to do once they leave um, and even with the patient themselves communication is key um, i found this little fact about um, communication problems are a major contributing factor to adverse events in hospitals accounting for 65 percent of sentinel events tracked by the joint commission so like i said the root of all evil um, and uh, the other thing that we that um, is good to note here is that transfer patients um, are excluded from calculation of most of the national quality measures, like those that are put on hospital compare. And so again, this is um, why we luck out and get our own little uh, little large measure as a critical access hospital. So um, back to the numbers. I just wanted to take a quick break there because I felt like. We're just doing numbers all day. And well, I like numbers, not everybody does. Um, this is a quick little screen capture right out of the manual for um, your sampling size. And um, it basically shows you, like I said, that you 
um, can choose a random sample. You're not going to report every single person, unless, of course, you only had um, less than 45 admissions or discharges, rather, in a quarter. Um, you can also report monthly. Uh, I believe that most um, of y'all are doing it quarterly, which if it were me, I would, because why do something every month if you can do it every three months? Um, but I imagine that this is something you work on, I would think, daily or pretty often to make sure that you're capturing all of this information. Um, the Again, the hospital, you can choose monthly or quarterly. Um, and uh, keeping in mind that the, the random sampling information and how that do is done is in the manual. I'm not going to walk through that. But if you have questions, please feel free to contact us or even better contact Stacy, um, and she can help you out at the Office of Rural Health. Jen? Um, yes. This is Ellen. I just wanted to, another little caveat on there is that um, they really do want you to have cases in all three months of a quarter. Um, so yes, you could sample 15, but just remember that you, you really need to have cases in all three months. Okay, good point. Thank you for that. And that is why Ellen is on the phone with us, to remind us of all those little bits. So on the next slide is um, something that Ellen uh, showed you last month as well. This is the EDTC reporting tool. It was created specifically for this measure. Um, it's the data collection tool that's in Excel. The link on the bottom of the screen there is where you get it. Um, and so this was designed when it was a special innovation project that Qualys Health did. Um, and so you might hear Qualys and or Telogen. They're a little bit interchangeable thanks to our last contract and some of the, um, some of us combined with others. So there's a, a big push from the FLEX program around this measure, and they're really uh, striving for 100% reporting across the country. And so this is a really big focus, which you may already know. Um, I'm not going to walk through this tool specifically. I just wanted to give you, again, a, a quick reminder of this is what it looks like. Um, and then Stacy asked me to remind everyone um, that when you you'll send this tool to her at quarterly and um, or you'll send this information to her quarterly and I just misspoke she does not want you to send the entire tool and it says that on the um, in the directions for the tool and there's several um, bits of like there's a manual on how to use this tool there's some videos and some audio files that walk you through using the tool at that link there. So it's a really good link, lots of information around how to do this successfully, at least use the tool. But there's reports you can generate out of it, and again, it walks you step by step through how to do those reports, and those are the only things you want to be emailing anywhere. If you send the entire tool to anyone, A, it's gigantic, and B, it contains um, protected health information, and so um, we don't want to be emailing that around because, of course, email is not as secure as we might like. Um, just as a quick reminder, we have a reporting event coming up at the end of next month, and so you will be sending in your um, reporting to the Office of Rural Health, and um, this is going to be your patients that we're seeing in quarter one of this year, so the ones you're seeing right now. And then uh, this data is aggregated and um, reported for the entire state. You also get um, your own specific reports back, but um, this is where that data, how that data is used. Um, you may notice that this has a, a quicker turnaround than those ones that are going through vendors and into QualityNet and um, down the rabbit hole and around the tree to get back to you, um, simply because it doesn't go through all of those uh, various steps to get to you. So uh, deadline coming up. If you have questions, let us know. I'm going to say that all day long. Um, so how do you go about improving um, this measure? And, and what, what does it mean that to improve? For instance, um, how do I know that I'm doing better? What am I striving for? What's my goal? What are my benchmarks? And a lot of that information is included in the reports. Um, but in interpreting MBQIP hospital data reports for quality improvement, another manual you can find on all of these websites, and again, 
there's resources at the end of the slot, uh, the presentation. Um, there's lots of good information out there. Um, but they suggest that you pick a low performing measure. And for low performing, they suggest a 90, 90th percentile is your goal for all your measures. And in some cases, the 90th percentile means you're reporting 100% on the measure. Um, so in that case, it's, a, it's comparing, the 90th percentile is comparing you to other hospitals in the state and across the nation. And so you want to be at or above that 90th percentile. Um, so if you have a piece that's, that's not reporting at 90%, you're going to want to look at that and keep in mind, again, you're going to have to unbundle this measure and look at it in each of its little smaller measures and even those tiny little data elements to determine what is it that's actually bringing your measure down. Um, because these bundled measures it kind of looks like, you know, you think you're doing pretty well and it's going to come back as no, you're not. And it's just one little thing that's got you um, that's causing problems. And so in that case, you're going to want to use the root cause analysis and the PDSA um, process that we talked about in the first module. And if you were here for that, great. If you weren't, there's a recording that you are welcome to listen to. Um, there's also some really good information from Stratus around um, using the RCA PDSA um, P poly improvement uh, tools to do this work. And so, again, you'll do some root cause analysis around what is my measure, why is it reporting low, why are we having trouble with this, and then you can look at um, ways to improve that. Again, within the various manuals, there's some strategies that they, they have listed, and I've put them here for you. Uh, they are, um, again, pretty back to basics around this stuff. So um, if you're using paper transfer forms, make sure that all the information that you're trying to capture uh, for the measure is on the form, because of course, if it's not there, you're not gonna do it, especially when you're in a situation where you're transferring somebody out of an emergency department. Um, typically, this is not a calm, cool, collected time for the patient or the nurses or the doctors or anybody that's working right then. And so if it's not on your form, then it's not going to happen. If you're not using paper forms and you're using a medical record, electronic medical record, make sure that there's prompts or there's, um, excuse me, the documentation in the EMR specifically has a spot for all of the data elements in the measure. And then, um, of course, if it's even if it's in there, make sure that when it gets transferred to the new facility, it's printed or it's going electronically, that what you've put in is actually included in the report that's going out. Um, I actually saw this with another, uh, of course, it was a nursing home, but it was that situation where they were printing a report and having trouble with something they were trying to fix. And the nurses insisted they were putting the information in, but of course, in the printed report, it wasn't showing up and come to find out. It's simply because the report wasn't pulling that field. Um, so again, make sure that it's not something as silly or simple as that, that your nurses are doing all the work and yet your form just isn't getting pulled correctly. Um, you can also look at developing some checklists and processes around double sign-offs or concurrent reviews of the records, um, making sure again that your documentation is adequate, um, making sure that you have a standardized process for that documentation and transfer. So regardless of what's happening, who the patient is, who the nurse or doctor is, that your process is in place and everybody knows what it is. Because um, as you may remember when we talked about um, root cause analysis, very, very rarely is it the individual's fault that something happened. Typically they were set up for failure. And so if your standardized process isn't there, um, then a new nurse or a new person on the floor or somebody who's just had emergency after emergency after emergency and it's been a terrible Monday or Tuesday or full moon day, um, it may miss something. And because these are small data elements, we want to make sure that we have a really good process for uh, capturing all of them. So that was kind of the emergency, de tra uh, emergency department transfer communication. I was, uh, when I was talking with Ellen earlier, I said, when you say EDTC, it feels like you're trying to smile for a, a picture. And so instead of say cheese, say EDTC. <laughs> um, it's a little bit of a tongue twister. So hopefully that's giving you a little bit of um, kind of an overview and getting got you thinking about what you might want to look at um, as far as if this measure isn't performing up to the standards you'd hoped. 
Um, I am working to get in contact with a, a hospital team here in Oregon that is doing really well with reporting these measures and um, we're trying to get them onto the round table call so we'll let you know that that, that has happened um, one way or the other so that they can talk about their process and how they've managed to consistently get high marks for this um, measure if you're struggling with it. Age caps. Um, you know, I should have written down healthcare. Ellen, what does age cap stand for? Do you know? Uh, you're you're going to do that. It's it's the hospital um, consumer assessments. Yes. Yes. It's that. yeah. It's that. And I think um, the S that I put on the end. I think S is survey. So survey. I may have been. That's a survey. Survey there for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So this um, measure, these measures, we're gonna, I'm gonna walk through the measures themselves kind of quickly. Um, they're uh, survey measures again, and they're uh, reported through a vendor. So um, you, as the quality person in your hospital, have to, the step you need to do is to go into QualityNet, secure portal, and make sure that your vendor is approved. So. You do it once when you get a new vendor. If you change vendors, you'll have to do it again. But for the most part, this one is kind of a plug and play. The vendor pulls the information um, and they provide the reports to, to back to you. Um, of course, those reports and how that happens is gonna vary by vendor. Um, but this is why some of these measures may take a little longer to get back to you. They're not something that you are putting into an Excel spreadsheet, as you know, and sending off. It's um, it's pulling the information through the vendor. So the data in these survey measures is um, cleaned and analyzed by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS. And then this information is publicly reported on the Hospital Compare website. So again, you get your own reports that have the detail you'll need to um, do some root cause analysis on them. And of course, you can um, plumb your own data as needed, but um, because there's not as much activity around the reporting of these on your part, um, I'm gonna walk through the, the denominators and whatnot a little more quickly. Um, but just so that you know what's happening and what's going into these are a reminder for those of you that have been doing this for a while. Um, the HCAPS composite six is the discharge information. And um, it's the number of patients or the percentage of patients rather that were surveyed that reported that yes, they were given information about what to do during their recovery at home. And so it being composite, there's two um, data elements within this composite. And so uh, the first one is, um, on the next slide, sorry. I gotta, gotta let Katie know to change the slide. So on the next slide, um, here on this slide, they want, they ask if during this hospital stay, did your doctors, nurses, and all the staff that talked with you um, talk about whether you would need help uh, when you left the hospital? And then the other data element is, did you get information in writing about what symptoms or health problems to look, look out for when you leave? So again, it's these, these composites and bundles of measures. And so when you're looking to improve them, you're gonna have to unpack them and figure out which piece of it is is causing you some challenges. So on the next slide, it's just a quick little um, review of the denominator and the numerator for this measure. Again, it's a random sample of adults, uh, your adult patients, so no kids, and it's um, obviously those that discharged uh, out of your hospital. So it specifically states that <laughs> those that expire within the hospital are not included in the measure, um, which I find a little, um, interesting and disconcerting because it's a, um, a sample, a survey, and it's hard to survey people if they can't answer the phone. But anyway, um, <laughs> and it's, uh, keep in mind too that this is gonna take a little bit of time to get back to you uh, because they have between 48 hours and six weeks after discharge to contact these people and get the surveys. And um, then it's even more complicated by the fact that it's the patients who answered always to these composite questions. And so um, on a, it's a Likert scale, a one to five, if you will, and always is, is a five. Um, 
And so we're looking for the percentage of folks that answer that this always happened. Um, so um, we're going to keep it just as difficult and as perfect as we as we can. So because this is, um, like I said, I don't want to focus too much on, on how you collect this measure, but more about how you improve this measure. And in the, in the manuals and in um, all of the research that I've done, teach back is the best way to communicate with patients, um, uh, really anyone uh, within especially stressful situations. But um, you may have heard the old adage, um, learn one or see one, do one, teach one. And that's truly how something sticks in your brain is you learn about it, you do it, and then you teach someone else to do it. And so in this case, they're teaching you back. Essentially, you're telling them, here's what you do um, to take care of yourself, or here's what you need. And then they're going to talk back to you or tell you in their own words what they need to know or do. And I think um, I've bolded that on the slide. And um, all of the learning that I've done around teach back, both within um, the team steps approach and working with a hospital here in Oregon that implemented teach back, um, that in their own words piece is, is key. And it's um, from what I heard from nurses and some of the quality folks that were working on this is it's the hardest because you want to correct them. Um, and you want them to use your words or the medical terms or the more specific term. Um, and really it's about getting to the heart of what they need to do to be able to care for themselves. So there is lots of information about teach back. Again, there's a resource on the, um, or there's a link on the resource slide. But this is, um, so it's research based. It involves them talking to you, and it could be the patient or the family member or both. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times we um, tend to focus on one or the other and focusing on both. If one of them picks up some and one picks up the other, that's better than none. Um, ideally, of course, we'd like everybody to know exactly what's going on. But our goal here is to prevent them from coming back to us or needing to go back into the system in any way. And so the better they understand it, the more likely they are to be able to care for themselves. And so you will continue to use the teach back until um, they've given you the information back in a way that you feel like they're going to be able to um, use it at home. So I've just included the 10 elements for uh, competence for using teach back in this um, presentation. Again, there's lots of information. It can be very involved. You can go to several day trainings on teach back. Um, but to keep it simple and to just give you sort of an overview, um, these 10 principles will get you going. Um, using a caring tone and attitude. You know, it's uh, when you're rushed and you're uh, trying to get someone out the door and you want to make sure they understand what's going on, teach back is, um, can be hard and this, t this caring tone of voice can also be hard. Um, comfortable body language and make eye contact. Standing over them is not the way to go. Um, this is where you're going to sit down next to them, you're going to look them in the eye, you're going to have a conversation with them using plain language. Um, we don't want to use all of our long, giant medical terms. Um, use words like they would use low back versus lumbar. I mean, just keep it simple and um, easy. And then again, you ask them to explain back using their own words. And when you ask them questions, you want to use non-shaming open-ended questions. And uh, the non-shaming is key, and sometimes we don't know that we're using shaming language or a tone of voice, and so that's where most of the education I've seen around Teach Back does a lot of role play and a lot of feedback to make sure that you're, you're grasping this. Um, you want to avoid asking questions that can be answered with simple yes or no. So that's those open-ended questions. So are you going to take your medications? Yes, I'm going to take my medications. As opposed to that, you might say, so now, tell me when or how you might take your medications, or um, what does your morning routine look like, and where does your medication regimen fall into that? So more open-ended, how they can, they say, well, I get up, I go to the bathroom, I have a glass of water, and maybe that's when I'll take my meds. So that sounds good. So you could just have them there on the counter, and when you take your first glass of water, take your medications. And so, um, and then, uh, again, you're going to, you're holding the responsibility. And so if they don't understand something, 
that's where you get you as a provider or you as a person are going to say, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that well. Let me try a different route as opposed to blaming. That's that non-shaming, non-blaming. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. Let me try again. Keep that responsibility on yourself. That helps them remain comfortable and understand. Um, you're going to just continue to do it until they get it right. If they say something that's not quite right, you say, wow, that's really close. Let's talk a little bit about this one piece. I want to make sure that we get this right. Um, make sure that I've explained it well enough that you can do it. Uh, Reader-friendly print materials to support the learning. And then, of course, we're going to document. So. Um, Reader friendly, um, we're discovering in several of our rural areas, uh, seventh grade reading level is maybe too high. So making sure that you know what your community um, needs and understands and um, if you can translate into other languages if that's needed, that's awesome. Um, but making sure that they're, they're reader friendly, they're nice big print and clear and not lots of strange funny colors or something that you've Xeroxed 100 times with blurry. So, again, this is Teach Back. It's a quick overview. If you'd like to learn more, there is a really good um, website. It's actually always used teachback.org. So, um, a really good resource for you to look at. So, care transitions. This is the HCAP Composite 7. It has um, three data elements in it. And again, it's the percentage of patients who strongly agree, which is the, this is another version of they said five, um, that they understood their care when they left the hospital. And so the data elements for this are that during their stay, uh, y'all took their preferences um, or those of their family or caregiver into account when you decided what was going to happen when I left. So, um, and I think this is, this is so subjective, it's going to be uh, it's difficult to do unless you have a really good open conversation with the family and the and the patient um, because what what the patient in bed A wants is completely different than what the patient in bed B wants and so this is where that really good conversation comes into play. The other one is when I left or the second one excuse me is when I left the hospital I had a good understanding of the things I was responsible for so all the things that I need to do to manage my health. I need to go to the doctor's appointment that you've made for me. I need to go to the drugstore to get my medications. I have a follow-up appointment with a therapist. I need to see that. So again, um, these two sort of go hand in hand. If you make a doctor's appointment for them, but their daughter can't take them, then we haven't really taken into account um, their needs when we decided to make them a doctor's appointment. And finally, and probably most difficult, is when I left the hospital, I clearly understood the purpose for taking each of my medications. So in that teach back example, not just that I'm going to take them in the morning, but why do I take them? You know, I take the little blue pill for this. I take the large pink pill for that. I take, um, and why they take them, which is, again, I don't know about you all, but when somebody says you need to do this, I always want to know why, because I'm, I'm not great at taking orders. And most people I believe are not. Um, <laughs> they really want to have a reason um, and an understanding of what they're doing. So, those are the three elements in this composite score. Again, it's a similar denominator and numerator. It's a random sample between 48 hours and six weeks, and they have to say, I strongly agree with that. Um, again, they got to have a five on this, so um, a, a tough one, and I think good, because um, of course this is also going to help with keeping them from coming back to you and being frequent flyers, and so, um, but definitely challenging. So, some strategies for this one would be, again, using TeachPack, uh, making sure that they understand what's going on. And then um, in team steps, which is strategies for, oh my goodness, I should know this. It was developed by the Department of Defense in, in um, their hospital system. And it's a, if you haven't heard about it or don't know about it, again, I put a resource in the slides, but um, it's a, a suite of different items that are used in the hospitals or different um, tools to improve communication and improve teamwork. And um, for this, I picked out a couple, handoff and I pass the baton. Um, handoff is sort of an overarching process. Like this is how you would hand off to someone within the hospital or outside the hospital. Um, I pass the baton is a specific sort of um, mnemonic for um, steps that you would use when you're sending someone completely out of your facility. 
So we'll walk through those really quick and then um, I'll leave some, some time for questions. So the elements in a good handoff are, um, are listed out here. There's about five of them. And um, we, we want to make sure that when we're doing a handoff, and again, this can be shift to shift. It can be um, from the emergency department to the floor of the hospital. It could be any of those times that you're transitioning a patient or you're handing off um, the care. You're transferring the responsibility and the accountability of that care to someone else. But keep in mind that, um, and I've put in italics here, you're accountable um, until both parties are aware of the transfer of responsibility. So until um, you said to that person or they've said, I get it, I got it, um, okay, I, I heard you. And again, um, there's something called check back, which is a little like teach back. It's in, it's in another team steps um, tool. And it's basically that thing we learn where you parrot back what you've heard. Okay, so here's what you said, or here's what I heard. Um, and it's just that way to make sure that everybody's on the same page. You wanna make sure that there's clarity. If there's uncertainty, it's your responsibility as the hander offer, <laughs> as the um, sender is what they call it, as the sender to um, make sure that the receiver understands everything correctly because if they don't, then it was your responsibility to make sure. So there's a verbal communication um, on the next slide, sorry. There's a verbal communication of information and so you want to, um, make sure that you said to them exactly what you need to happen. And I believe that that's part of why, um, back to our EDPC measure, the very first one is that there should be a healthcare, to healthcare facility transfer of information and a physician to physician, because there's a lot that you can say that isn't written down. Um, and you can't uh, assume, and we all know what assuming does, you can't assume that the person that's taking the responsibility will actually read your written directions, and if they do, that they'll understand them. Um, so that actual verbal communication is extremely important. You wanna get acknowledgement by the receiver. Again, they need to say, yep, I got it, I, I'm, I understand, we'll take care of it, or I'll take care of it. Um, because until they do, it's still your responsibility, you're still responsible for that patient and their care. And then it also gives you an opportunity to review. So as you're going through your handoff and you're talking about what's going on, you have a new pair of eyes or a new person. And so they may ask you a question you hadn't thought about, or they may um, ask for a clarification, or as you're, as you're speaking, things were popped up in your head and you're reminded um, that, oh yes, and I wanted to tell you this about their family or, or something like that. So it's just a great opportunity to kind of review. Um, and so that's kind of the overview of what a good handoff looks like. This um, mnemonic, like I said, is um, really specifically to when you're sending your person, your patient to another facility. You wanna make sure that you've covered each of these elements. And I've seen people do um, forms that have this so that they might make some notes for themselves so they remember to get all the elements in. It includes in here, you'll see SBAR or all of the elements of the situation, background assessment and recommendation or request. Um, and it's just, again, a tool to make sure that all of the information that needs to be passed along to that receiving person or facility has gotten there. Um, I'm not gonna read through every one of these, but one of the things, a couple of them that I will point out is, um, you wanna introduce yourself and your role or your job. Um, including the patient, but make sure you introduce yourself. Um, I've noticed that a lot of times uh, um, when I was working in the nursing home, um, our staff and our team would call people and say, hey, I'm calling from blankety blank care center and I have this and that information, but I never heard them say, hey, this is Jen from the care center, Jen Wright, and I'm the administrator, and I'm calling to tell you this. Um, and, and it just, so if there's questions, they know who to call back. Um, and it also just sort of establishes uh, who you are and what you do and, and your role will tell the, the receiving person um, what involvement level you've had with that patient. So, and then also under safety concerns, especially for our rural folks and in the emergency department, um, socioeconomic factors, 
you don't necessarily think about that when you're transitioning somebody who's especially in an emergent situation or you're sending them out of your facility. But um, socioeconomic factors, especially in my work that I'm doing now with care coordination, are, I believe, more than half, if not 100%, but a huge factor in people readmitting to the hospital. Um, so when you have those safety concerns, you know, hey, I'm sending you a person who's got all this really terrible stuff going on, and oh, by the way, they're homeless. <laughs> um, it's important information because the receiving facility needs to know, or the receiving um, entity needs to know that when they're ready to discharge, there's nowhere to send them except back to their tent um, or back to the street. Or they need to know that they don't have electricity at home, so don't send them home with lots of electrical devices to keep them well. Um, I think that's a pretty, uh, I just want to point that one out. And so that's I pass and hope you saw the baton really quickly as we, mm -hmm. <laughs> the computer jumped by. Um, again, you'll see as far um, the background and the actions, I think that's the, you know, here's what we've done, here's what we'd like you to do, some rationale, timing, how important, and then ownership again. Who's responsible um, from your facility as well as the patient and family responsibilities? And then um, what you'd like to see next, so that's sort of the R, the request, the, um, excuse me, recommendation from SBAR. And again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus a little bit on ownership. Who are you, how do they get a hold of you? Once they get that patient, if they, need a, if they have a question, who do they call? Give them a name, give them a number. Um, this is the, one of the main reasons why I see transitions fail, is they get someone, they have a question, they call an emergency department, and we all know what emergency departments look like, and it's crazy and they don't know who to ask for. Well, I don't know, the nurse that just sent me this patient, oh my goodness, that could be anybody, and depending on how busy you are that night, it may be one, it may be really obvious, or you may have three or four or five nurses running around and you just have no idea, so um, making sure that you uh, include that information. So, again, I just wanted to give you a couple of uh, tools that you can pass on or use that will help you with those transitions and handoffs. Um, that's a huge failure point in our healthcare system just in general, is anytime we're transitioning someone from even a primary care office to a specialty care office. It's just, it's a, it's a big gap. And so um, the more we can do to close it, the better. So um, I would like to quickly review that we talked about the definition of care transition. Um, we talked about the care transition measures and hopefully gave you some um, ideas for impacting these measures. I promised there'd be resources and there are lots of resources. I have two slides full of resources for you today. The MBQIP National um, Rural Health Resource Center is kind of the overarching, um, if you have an MBQIP question, go here first. Um, if you have an EDTC question, the um, the resources page has, um, like I said, there's the specifications guide. There's the there's an audio overview that walks you through the manual. Um, it's about 20 minutes, um, and you can follow along with your manual. There's some there's a the tool is posted there. How to use the tool, a web and a video on how to input into the tool. Um, it's a really great resource. And then, of course, the quality improvement toolkit that I talked about, where they walk you through using um, using the root cause analysis and P or PDSA for improving your uh, transfer measure. And then interpreting, I, I gave you a little bit of information about out of that um, interpreting your hospital data reports around setting that 90th percentile. And on the next page is the always use Teachback website and the Team Steps website. Um, I am a Team Steps master trainer, as is Carrie Beck, who's the lead on this project. And so, um, if you have questions about Team Steps, we're happy to answer those. Lots of great tools to keep your teams um, on track and doing what's best for them and their patients. And then, on the next slide is questions. So I'll stop talking. Um, last time I showed you a picture of my puppy. This time it's a picture of an elephant that I was blessed and lucky enough to get to take in person in Africa. Um, questions or uh, elephants, you know, they have that long-term memory, so hopefully this will help you uh, with your memory. So I'm going to pause for a second, see if anybody's in chat. 
We have a question on the phone. No chat. Oh, we have a chat. It says thank you, Jim. Oh, well, you're welcome. Um, you unmuted everyone? Okay. I agree. Plain talk is extremely helpful, even if you're not really new. Um, I just feel like the, the simpler, the better. If we can speak English even with each other, we're better off. Um, one of the things that, just while you're thinking about questions and things, one of the things that we have challenges with around our office is we have a really bad habit of using acronyms or, you know, and so like MBQIP and EDTC and all of those things. And um, when you're talking to somebody who doesn't know what they are, it can be really frustrating and confusing. And so every so often in meetings, one of us will put our hand up and go, um, what does that mean? What are you talking about? I don't understand. I believe you can just talk in uh, if you have a question or type it in. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Any comments or I guess it doesn't have to be a question, it can be all right, well. Hearing nothing, I'm gonna jump to the next slide. Um, I believe that Ellen went over this information with you at the last call, but I just wanna put it up here one more time. We do have a, an initiative around antibiotic stewardship in outpatient settings going on right now. Um, and so if you are working with any practices or you know of any um, folks in your area um, or your emergency department would like to be involved in this, um, you can visit the website. It's called the Get Smart. Um, and we know that uh, the use of antibiotics is a little out of hand these days. And so um, we have a little bit of a project going on around that. It should be fun that we're um, engaging folks right now. So there's the information for that. So in conclusion, um, you'll get an evaluation in the email. Um, I did read the evaluations from last time and appreciate the information I got, so please feel free to fill those out. As I mentioned, we have a roundtable sharing call coming up in a couple weeks. It'll be the same bat time, same bat channel. Um, we do the, the Tuesday at 11 a.m. to noon slot. <clears throat> and like I said, I'm working to get a hospital team that's doing really well on the EDTC measure to come and talk to you all about uh, what they're doing and how they've gotten their system to work well. Our next webinar is a month from today. Um, it'll be around patient safety and patient engagement, engagement measures. Um, and I believe Carrie is presenting that uh, discussion. So you'll get to talk with Carrie. She's not with us today. She's actually doing another webinar for another her other project because um, we don't want to sit around and do nothing. So we double book ourselves. Um, and then uh, finally, our contact information is listed on the slides. Uh, I've listed Carrie again. She's the project lead for this um, for this project, and um, my information is there as well. Uh, please feel free to contact us with questions or comments. Um, and you do you should have gotten the slides mailed. And um, if you have any if you need any additional information, let me know. Um, also. With, along with the slides is a, um, an August MB, I think it was the August version of the MBQIP newsletter that Stacy shared with me, and I went ahead and shared that out with all of you because it does talk about the um, emergency department transfer communication measure in that um, newsletter. If you're not getting that, I believe it tells you on there how you can get it. Um, I glanced through it and found it to be pretty uh, useful and informative. It's short. Looks like it comes out monthly from the uh, national and be quick folks so all right hearing hearing nothing else or seeing nothing else I'm gonna uh, go ahead and close this call and give you five whole minutes back to your day you might have time to eat lunch um, thank you all very much for uh, being here and listening and we look forward to hearing from you in a couple weeks
have a great Tuesday.